Take your Bibles over to the book of James. Over the last number of years, I think I've heard this more and more as time has gone on, people telling me that they are or have been diagnosed, so to speak, have diagnosed as bipolar. And uh, psychiatrists uh, like labels. They like to put a label on things. Um, for years, they, they liked the term schizophrenic. And schizophrenic, um, what it kind of meant was, well, we don't know what else to call you. You know, I mean, they had this you know, catch-all category that, that they just threw people in. And I think bipolar is very similar to that. You just hear it so often. Um, really, what it is, is uh, sometimes you feel up, and sometimes you feel down. Anyone here ever have that happen to you? Sometimes you're up emotionally, and sometimes you're down emotionally. You're all bipolar. Um, I had a preacher call me here uh, some time back, and he, his son had been, you know, of course, raised up in, in ministry, and, and, um, and when he graduated high school, he decided that he didn't believe in God. After he, he left home and then called his dad and said, I just want you to know I don't believe in God, and uh, I don't appreciate all the stuff that we made me go to church, and made me do this, and made me do that, and some pastor preachers, of course, a nightmare. And uh, anyway, he ran off and joined the military, and uh, got married to a, a girl that we didn't know her. And uh, the military has now, he, he's been in contact with his dad since this, and the military told him his problem is he's bipolar. Of course, he, he was never that at home. He just, now, now he is. And they put him on medication and, and all this type of stuff. And so he called me and he said, I don't know what to do. What, what does the Bible say about this bipolar issue? And I've been asked that numerous times and by that point. About the only thing I, at that time, was able to refer him to was to this idea that we see in the book of James in verse number um, 8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and I said you know I, I think probably the term bipolar in the Bible is summed up in this concept of being double-minded uh, to two extremes okay and that's what the concept bipolar uh, you know two extremes extremely high extremely low and um, as a matter of fact um, the term bipolar used to be called manic depressive. So if you don't know what bipolar is, maybe you've heard of manic depressive. That used to be the term that they used for this. And so I referred him to that. And then the next day I thought, you know, I wonder kind of what else might be here in the book of James and, and that I could look at and help him with uh, to be able to help his son. And so as I sat down, I read, started reading here in the book of James with the idea of what is the Bible saying here concerning a double-minded person, and does it really apply, or does it just seem similar? And as I read through the book of James, um, I, I was astounded at what I found in this regard. Um, and I'm, I'm really going to label this, not bipolar, because that's a secular term, that, that uh, secular counseling term, a label that they like to put on people. But really what a person that has extreme up and down emotional conditions wants is emotional stability. And so we're going to address this from that concept of how does a person achieve emotional stability so that their normal, the normal flow of emotions, and by the way, everyone has normal ups and downs. Nobody is always up or always down. There's normal kind of ebb and flow, like a wave, if you will, or a tide of emotion. But when we allow ourselves to be drawn into a purely emotional state 
to where everything in life is just about the tides of emotion, then we, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble. And so a lot of people have this label hanging around their neck uh, and weighing them down, and, and, and it's destroying their life because uh, their thought is, I am mentally ill. I'm mentally, I'm chemically imbalanced. You ever heard that phrase? Here's the truth. There is no test that you can take. You can't go to the doctor, get a blood test, uh, you know, uh, any other kind of test to tell you that you're chemically imbalanced. That is a misnomer. You know how they determine psychiatric diagnoses? They have a big convention every year, and they vote on what they think a, psych, uh, a mental disorder is. It's, the, it, it's not like cancer, where they can say, yeah, we found cancer cells. There is no bipolar cell, right? There, there, there are all of these things. These are, these are diseased by, by executive fiat of the psychiatric uh, administration or psychiatric um, uh, association. Community. Yeah. And th that's why there's more and more and more and more because you don't get paid um, you don't get paid from insurance for saying someone's a Frady cat. You get paid because they have anxiety disorder. You know? Uh, and so if you want it's all about money. And, and and I hate to say it that way, but it is all about money. It's all about making money. Because during the times of greatest tragedy in the United States, the reality is, is we had strong, much stronger people as a result of tragedy, and now if somebody's internet Wi-Fi goes down, you know, they have a mental breakdown and they have to be hospitalized and they, they're on medication and, and uh, all that, and so everyone's looking at the guy in the back, but, um, but uh, hopefully we can help him today, all right? Hopefully we can help him today. That was the past, all right. So, um, I want you to take your Bible there to James chapter number one. We're going to read a couple verses. We're going to begin to examine this. And I'm not making light. I'm not trying to minimize the seriousness of problems that people have. I'm simply trying to say that we live in a culture that has tried to make people all that are just our normal emotional condition, our normal emotional condition, into a disease, into a, uh, so that we are hypersensitive to every little movement. It's like um, it's you know it's like when you're driving your car and uh, you you know you hear something and all of a sudden you start what was that what was this what was that what was this and, and you begin to be oversensitive about things, and you come up with all kinds of things that might be wrong. Well, the reality is, is that God tells us what these emotional tides are, and why they are there, and how why we experience them. So, begin, if you will, in James chapter number one. It says, "A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, my brethren." Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So spiritually, we see a pattern here in the Bible, in the book of James, that will help us to identify the issues of the ups and down feelings that many people do experience. And I want to notice there, verse 2 through verse number 8 in particular, a few things about this description. First of all, the wavering or double-minded person, according to the scripture here, goes up and down without control of their own. Now, get the picture that's being presented. Waves of the sea, right? It says uh, in verse number um, 6, he, uh, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So he is 
at the mercy of the wind and the waves, according to this verse. That's a real situation. That's a real emotional condition. And, and so he's tossed, the Bible says. He doesn't have the ability to achieve stability on his own. If you've ever been in a boat during a storm, you would understand the picture that's used here. You're subject to the movement of the waves. Your, bu- your boat doesn't stay on the same level. Uh, it goes up and down uh, based on the movement of the water. And there's an interesting description that emotionally would seem to uh, have a physical connotation, if you will, uh, if you consider this, this idea of someone being bipolar, tossed up and down emotionally without the ability to control their emotional condition, and the likening here is of someone tossed up and down physically without the ability to control their physical condition, right? They're driven and they're tossed, the Bible says. Someone in a boat that goes through this would experience what we call, anyone know? Seasickness. Anyone ever had seasickness before? It's a physical condition results in, resulting from the continual upheaval that you're physically experiencing. As a matter of fact, you can take medication to deal with that. Dramamine, right? Or you can wear those C-band uh, wristbands or put that little dot behind your ear or whatever. I think that's also a Dramamine. Something like that, right? No, you can't do that? It's a chemical. I know, that's what I'm saying. It's a medication. There's medications that you can take. Um, but, but really, the cure, the cure for seasickness is smooth water or land, right? Getting out of the boat. That's the cure, all right? Um, now, in this, in a sense, that's kind of what happens with this issue of bipolar, because here's what happens. A person's emotionally up and down, up and down, up and down. So guess what? The doctor gives a medication. And if it's real severe, the doctor says, let's take you out of your environment and put you in this hospital. And you're isolated from the the, the, the situations in life that are causing your turmoil. And so they do basically the same thing to treat bipolar that they do to treat seasickness. They medicate and isolate or remove in both situations. Now, it's important to to, uh, see a correlation here because the Bible's giving us this idea of someone who is emotionally unstable and it's making this the comparison or the example, if you will. So... The secular approach is very similar to what you might treat this physical issue with. Now, let's turn our attention here, though, to what causes a person's life to be driven in such a way as to create these ups and downs that we are looking at emotionally. In the text, we reference reference here in James, we see two driving factors. Does anyone notice them? Temptation and trials. Did you notice those? Temptation and trials. All right, verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work with patience. Right? Uh, So temptation and trials. And we're going to notice those again, looking down in verse number 12. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And, uh, and, and all through the scriptures here, we're going to see that, that relationship between temptation and trials here in the book of James. Now, each of these work in a slightly different fashion. Temptation, and we'll notice this more as we go along, is an upward drive to the flesh. Temptation says, I can have, I can achieve, I can be. And it's a drawing to the flesh upward, to the lusts upward, toward embracing a sinful thing, okay? And so temptation moves the emotions up. When you're tempted, there's an exhilaration that comes 
chemically in your body, emotionally in your heart, and, you, and your mind is drawn about the possibility that em, is embraced in that temptation or seed in that temptation. On the other hand, trials are a downward driving force. Trials take away the promise of temptation and leave us dashed and falling, right? Because of these horrible trials and problems that we are experiencing. Temptations are the attempt to draw us away from our beliefs by enticing our lusts, and trials are the attempt to investigate the validity and certainty of our beliefs. Now, that's very important. We're going to notice this continuation of thought throughout this passage, throughout this book. But both of these, both temptations and trials, are given to prove us. To prove us. They are given to determine whether or not what we have is genuine and real. As a matter of fact, when you look through um, these this, ver- this uh, chapter, what you find is that, that God talks about in chapter number two, and we're going to get into this in just a moment, but he talks about this issue of real faith versus fake, fa- fake faith, right? That's chapter number two. What's real? If, if you have real faith, brethren, then it's not just words. There are actions that come along with it. And real faith is important. And so he begins in chapter 1 talking about this, this conflict that we face between trials and temptations and how they're constantly putting us in upheaval. But the purpose of these things is to determine what is genuine and real in our lives. Now, notice this in verse number 17, uh, verse 16. He gets done talking about temptation and lust and so forth. He says in verse 16, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, every good gift and every perfect gift, that's an interesting statement. Good gifts teach us what is good by enduring temptation. Temptation is a a fake goodness, isn't it? We think it's going to be good, but when we embrace it, we find out it was rotten. What we learn is that by enduring temptation, we find what is genuinely good. It's a good gift to endure temptation. A perfect gift comes from enduring trial. Because as as we endure trials, it perfects us. So we learn what is genuinely good by enduring temptation. We learn what was what is genuinely perfect by enduring trials. And God puts both of these things in our life. God does not tempt us, but he allows temptation in our life. He allows trial in our life because these two things are what teach us what is good and what is perfect. And they reveal what is real in our hearts and in our lives. The scriptures are interesting here in verse number 9 through 11 concerning this fact that temptation and trials work in opposite ways to to, uh, examine us or to expose us, if you will. In verse number 9 it says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof faileth, uh, falleth, and the grace and the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Notice that in both of these instances, there is a movement. In the first, from that which is low to an exalted position, and in the second, from that which is high to a depressed position. Temptation is that upswing, and trials are the down. Everyone is equal in the fact, everyone, whether poor or rich, is equal in the fact that they will either be tempted or tried, depending on where they are in life at different times. A person who is poor will be tempted by possessions, and an exalted position 
and even pride in their person, as if as though they had made something of themselves when they achieve a certain stature. Yet in other ways, when a person feels they're on top of the world, the trials that war against us will bring us down. And the question is, how do you endure these ups and downs? How do you face these ups and downs that come in life? And how do you endure temptation that seeks to exalt you and trials that seek to depress you? Well, the Bible's very clear here that the stabilizing factor in this process is faith and patience. These two factors, faith and patience. Faith can be described as simply being confident or certain that something is true or that it works. The purpose of temptations and trials are help to help us determine where our faith is genuine and where it is fake, where it is fake. Genuine faith produces patience when faced with temptation and trials. Fake faith, however, produces hypocrisies that are revealed when confronted with the same issues. Throughout the book of James, the issue is presented in a variety of different manners, and we'll notice that this morning. But the pattern becomes clear. It, it's that if you begin with genuine faith, it produces a not noticeable function or work, and this, in turn, produces feelings or affections that accompany faith. Now, so notice this. The James says, faith produces function or works, and that produces our feelings. All right? So our feelings are to follow our faith. And what our faith does. Now it's important to understand that pattern. Assurance produces actions, uh, which produce affections. Is another way we might say it. Faith produces function, which produces feelings. That's the proper view of life as seen in the Book of James. However, if we confuse faith with feelings. And that's often the case. Now, please hold on to what I'm about to tell you because this is very important. If we're looking for a feeling, instead of basing our belief upon certain confidence, it will not achieve the same result. Because faith, or because feelings, I'm sorry, that produce our functions will produce frustration. Right? This is a far different issue. If feelings produce our functions. It produces frustration. I was uh, doing some counseling a while back, and it, it became clear to me that the situation for this individual was that they misunderstood faith and feelings, and their entire spiritual life was the idea that they didn't have great faith because they were missing the feeling. And so what they were pursuing was this feeling, this emotional sensation. And so they were doing things to serve God, but they were doing them in the pursuit of feeling as if this feeling was faith. But faith is not a feeling. Faith is a certain knowing and confidence. And when we have a certain knowing and confidence, it motivates our activity that we can be, that a feeling can be produced in us, certainly. But if our pursuit is of the feeling, then we're never going to have that, that, that satisfaction because we're always going to be pursuing it. And we're going to be frustrated in the Christian life constantly. The result of that, then, is that we are filled with hypocrisies, trying to cover up those, those places that are rotten, those places that aren't right, that aren't filled with faith, because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So we're trying to constantly cover up that area that's not right to compensate so we can pursue the feelings that we want 
instead of just living by faith in the now and now and facing the temptations and trials, but because a person in this condition is driven by their feelings in pursuit of a feeling, they're more prone to temptation because they want a feeling. That's what they're all after. And so when temptation comes along, the promise of the fulfillment of feelings is too strong for them to withstand. So they pursue it. They reach an emotional high, and then they find out as the canvas is torn away that it wasn't genuine or real. So they have the dramatic drop of trial, and there you find your emotional high and low. Notice the contrast of genuine faith versus hypocritical faith here beginning in James chapter number 1, verse number 22. We won't take time to read all of these things, but look at verse number 21 uh, and 22. Wherefore, lay aside filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, and be doers of the word and not hearers only. Notice this next statement. Deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So verse number 22 through verse number 25 contrasts hearing only and trying to cover up the genuine with just hearing, contrasted with doing what we were told is right to do. Contrast, pursuit of our feeling. I want to hear I want to hear it because I, I, I want that feeling. I want that experience. Versus, so the Bible says to do this, okay? I'm going to do it by faith. They both produce a function, but the latter produces only frustration. Hearing versus doing. Verse 26 and 27, contrast genuine religion with vain religion. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and that defiled before God is the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In chapter number 2, verse 1 through 10, contrast the respect of God versus the respect of of man, verse 11 through 13, the personal obedience to God versus judging others, uh, verse 14 through 16, contrast compassion with neglect. This is why James goes on to teach that it isn't what we say, but what we do that reveals the true nature of our faith, because that's the core issue, our confidence. Notice this st stable line. You know what we could call this? Confidence. Stability. The word faith and the word confidence are somewhat interchangeable. Um, genuine faith produces works that are revealed in their nature, but fake faith, one that is in word only when faced with temptation and trials, will be evidenced by the error that it produces, and it will crumble when it's confronted. And that's why James spells it out in this fashion in chapter 2, verse 17 through 26. Notice with me here. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, that's a key word, say thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was count, imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So since genuine faith is the force that produces stability in our lives, what is it that this faith must be based in? Now, for the person who's not trusting in God, 
They may place their confidence or their faith in their own abilities. They may place that in certain loved ones. They may put it in their career or some other life factor that they've chosen. There's somewhere that they put their confidence. Maybe it's their education. Maybe it's that buddy they grew up with. Maybe it's the economy or, or something foolish like that. But when their confidence in this factor is shaken, then their stabilizing force is removed. A person can seem stable and normal for years and years because somewhere their confidence is placed in something that hasn't been shaken yet. But once that confidence is shaken, once that confidence is removed, all of a sudden they're unmoored emotionally. And now they're prone to these ups and downs of emotion where before they were seemingly stable. They're tossed with the waves of temptation and trials. Ultimately, what they're looking for is something else to stabilize them, something to grab onto. That's why they grab onto the promise of temptation and they fall with the destruction of trial. And this, of course, is not what God wants because everyone that, that you will find in this world, everything you'll find in this world, and everyone you'll find in this world is temporary. So if that's what you put your confidence in, you're always going to be in upheaval. Our abilities diminish, our loved ones die, our careers end, economies crash, societies change. There's absolutely nothing consistent and continual in this world at all. Now that doesn't mean there's nothing that can bring stability to our emotional state, though. Because in spite of the uncertainty of this world, there is one that transcends this world and never changes. That's what it says in James 1, verse 17 and 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. For of his will begat us, us with the word of truth, that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creature. Remember what I said? Good gift is God showing us that temptation won't bring gratification. Perfect gift is God showing us that even in trials, we can trust him. And he removes the facade, the fakeness. And I realize that he alone is the stabilizing factor in this world. God isn't driven by the issues of the world. He's consistent. He never changes. We're reminded of that truth in the last book of the Old Testament, right before the Bible goes silent for 400 years. It says in Micah 3, verse number 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So there's no changing in God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, according to Hebrews 13 and verse number 8. And as James says, there's no variableness or shadow of turning. That means he's stable. He's consistent at all times. And as such, when a person finds themselves facing temptation and trials, the only stabilizing thing that they can hold on to is the consistent nature of God. Not only is God himself our source of, con of confidence, but according to this verse in James, we saw the verse we saw last, the word of truth is stable and used by God. And that means that we can trust the Bible. We can have confidence that the word of God is true. The word of God does not change. It's forever settled in heaven. And we can hold it in our hands. And is it any wonder that there's been such a ver vociferous attack against the word of God for so long in the United States of America, and a tearing down of the confidence in the Word of God, why it says so many different things, depends on which one you read, depends on where you look and who you talk to, where's the Word of God? We may not have it, we don't really have it, we can't trust it. Why? Because it gives stability. Is it any wonder that the Word of God is no longer trusted in America and people are unmoored emotionally so that they're constantly tossed up and down and this concept or idea of bipolarism is rampant and epidemic? They have nowhere to put their confidence. There's no stabilizing factor. Because once the Word of God is not trustworthy, once you can't have confidence supreme deity, where will you put your confidence to bring stability? So 
this is the picture we see in James. This tossed picture because of a lack of real faith, real confidence. So let's take a short break here and see what the Bible then, when we come back, we'll see what the Bible has to say about bringing that stability back into our lives.